All right, hello, and welcome to my video about how to design a protected intersection. I am Matt Pinder. I am a transportation engineer, and I design streets like this for work, but I'm also very passionate about encouraging the use of walking and cycling and transit as modes of transportation. And I have done a lot of design of, in particular, protected intersections through my work. Now, I'll link in the description on what protected intersections are. There's some great resources out there. But uh, the purpose of this video is to show that designing protected intersections is not actually something that is difficult and it shouldn't be intimidating. So uh, whether you're an advocate or another designer or just someone who's interested in learning more about these, I hope this video is useful for you in learning about how a safer intersection design for pedestrians and cyclists can come together. So I am challenging myself today because I've designed so many of these to design a protected intersection from scratch in 10 minutes or less. I'm going to first share with you a little bit about the intersection I've chosen, and then I'm going to start the clock and we'll see how far I get. So uh, we're looking today at the city of Burlington in the province of Ontario in Canada. And we're looking at the intersection of Brant and Fairview Street. You can see this is a pretty large intersection today. There's turn lanes in all directions, multiple through lanes, long crossing distances, and right turn channels. The reason I have picked this location, one reason is that it has a very large footprint, which gives a lot of opportunity to, to work with more space to repurpose that for pedestrians and cyclists. It also does have existing cycling facilities to an extent in every direction. So it's a natural choice for upgrading to make safer for cycling and pedestrians. And then finally, uh, it's very close to downtown Burlington, just south of here, a very pedestrian and intensifying area. And immediately east is Burlington GO Station, a major regional rail station that has been upgraded and has new bike parking and is a very natural destination to safely cycle to. So that's the intersection we're going to be working with. In terms of the guidelines that I'm working with today, I'm mostly using uh, Ontario's Book 18 Cycling Facilities, a guide that I contributed to, and also the Ottawa Protected Intersection Design Guide, another really great resource for designing protected intersections. I'll put a link in the description to that as well. So I'm using a tool called Bluebeam, and this is a tool that allows me to measure and do a kind of a markup of an aerial image that is scaled. So rather than just uh, doing squiggles on a map, I'm going to come up with a design that actually is proportional to what could be built here. All right, so without further ado, let's get going. I'm going to start out by uh, the key with the protected intersection is that the bike lanes go on the outside of all the vehicle lanes. So first, you can see there's a bike lane to the left of the through lane, the right turn lane. I'm going to measure out a new right turn lane that's going to go here. And that is going to become the new curb line for this intersection. So it's going to be left through, through, right. And then I'm going to measure out the new curb line on the east side here as well. You can see that with a protected intersection, all the bike infrastructure goes into the boulevard of the roadway. So my new curbs are going to be there. And I'm just going to assume you, you need to do some analysis to determine the right corner radius to use. But for an arterial, arterial intersection like this, 12 meters is somewhere in the realm of possibility. So I'm going to assume that that will be the curb radius that I can work with. So immediately, you can see by taking the bike facility off the road into the boulevard and turning this right turn channel or slip lane into an uh, adjacent or a, a normal right turn lane, I have created a lot of extra boulevard space. There it is. And I'm going to repeat this for all the other intersection corners. Okay, so on the north side, there are only two through lanes going to the intersection. So because there's only two through lanes, we only need two through lanes on the other side of the intersection. Okay. 
And then receiving on this side of the intersection, again, I see three lanes, but only two actually going through the intersection. So I can shrink up the west side of the intersection. It's okay that the third lane over there could form after the intersection. Maybe it's needed for the next intersection. I'm not too sure. But at this intersection itself, there, there is no need for that extra lane. Okay, three of four corners done. Let's finish off this step for the last corner. There we go. Okay, all four corners have been significantly reduced in terms of the space given to vehicles. And we have a lot more boulevard that we can now work with in terms of allocating space to people cycling. So I'm going to make that pavement marking there on all of my right turn lanes to make it very clear where the right turn lanes are. Okay, what's next? We are going to draw our setback crossings. This is one of the distinctive features of protected intersections. Again, one of the biggest benefits of protected intersections is when you make cyclists and pedestrians more visible by setting them back from the corner radius itself. So I'm going to allow a cyclist to actually cross back here, and then the pedestrians will cross behind them. So I'm going to make this wider, and I'm gonna make it green to represent the green of a cross ride. Okay, similar, I'm gonna do the same thing for the other approaches. The setback can be a range. Five meters is kind of the center of that range, but it can be, you know, it, it's whatever you can fit. Four is the minimum that's usually desirable, but you can go six meters or higher. It really depends on the context. I really enjoy using this tool, Bluebeam. It, uh, as you can see, has a lot of really cool features and, you know, it's a simple tool, but it, you can get a lot done in a short amount of time in terms of drawing markups and communicating design ideas, which is something I do quite frequently in my job. That step is now done. You can see I have nice five meter setback crossings on all of my corners. So a cyclist who's crossing here will be much easier to see for a right turning driver. Next is the pedestrian refuges. So this is another key part of the intersection design. Cyclists travel in the boulevard and pedestrians cross the cycle track before crossing the road. That helps keep the roadway crossing distance uh, less for pedestrians and it helps separate out the number of conflicts that pedestrians occur or experience in one crossing. And it makes it easier for cyclists to navigate through the intersection too, as you'll see when, when this starts to come together. I'm drawing three meter deep pedestrian refuges. These can be wider or a little bit narrower depending on how much space you have. But they, it is important to keep them above a minimum so that uh, someone using a wheelchair uh, does not have trouble navigating through this area. Okay, now I'm going to actually draw the path of the cycle tracks within the boulevard. So I have enough info now that I can show what's going to happen. So this northbound approach, the bike lane is no longer floating. We have moved it to be against the curb on the approach. And at some point before the intersection, it's going to enter the boulevard, as you can see here. Whoops, I have one more pedestrian refuge to measure. draw my first cycle track. I'm gonna use a green line just for simplicity here. Let's assume the bike lane is on the road. And then at some point on the approach to the intersection, it enters the boulevard and it's going to flare out before that pedestrian crossing. And then it's going to kind of wrap around the corner here, go behind that pedestrian crossing and then taper back towards the roadway 
where it'll then continue as an on-street bike lane. So if you're a cyclist and you're turning right at this intersection, you actually can stay out of interaction with vehicle traffic the entire time, which is pretty, pretty awesome. And then to complete this corner, cyclists coming through the cross right here will have another cycle track that runs through the corner and then allows them to connect like that. So there you see the other, the next benefit of a protected intersection corner. If you're going east and you wanna head north, you don't have to merge into traffic and turn left like a vehicle. You cross once and then you wait here, cross twice, and then you get to continue north with a lot less conflict. Okay, we're getting very close to having something workable here. You can see that I've got the path of cyclists basically worked out. This green line is equivalent to a two meter wide cycle track. So that's a pretty generous amount of space provided to a cyclist. Now I'm just going to indicate where pedestrians from the boulevard will cross the cycle track to get to that pedestrian refuge area. There's different ways you can design those, but you wanna make sure that they encourage cyclists to yield to pedestrians with signage and pavement markings and maybe even raising or lowering the crossings. And just to really wrap things up, you see I've got the right turn arrows, so it's very clear how I've reconfigured my vehicle lanes. I'm gonna add the vehicle stop bars. So you will notice that a big change with protected intersections, they do end up with the vehicle stop bar set back quite a bit from where it is previously. You can see it's back there. And this also helps stopped motorists to have much better sight lines to what's going on at the intersection. When you're stopping uh, right before the corner, it's gonna be harder to see if a cyclist or a pedestrian is coming behind from behind you that you need to yield to. Okay, and I'm gonna wrap it up there. That is a protected intersection in a nutshell. You can see we've taken on-street floating bike lanes that split between the through and the right turn lanes, and we've moved them into the boulevard on all of the approaches. We've taken away those right turn channels, and you can see the massive amount of boulevard space that's created here. That's gonna give more space for wider sidewalks, more room for amenities and benches, and for people to wait to cross the intersection and uh, dramatically improving the safety of the intersection without having to take extra property. Anybody cycling through here to the GO station or to downtown Burlington is gonna be uh, a lot more comfortable going through this design than what was there before. So just a few notes on what would be next in the design process. There's some accessibility stuff that needs to be added, tactile warning surface indicators for people using canes, other types of uh, design features that could help someone navigating to find their way to the crossing. Um, we wanna make sure that when this intersection gets signalized that safety improvements are considered as well, like preventing right turn on red from being allowed. And then even the still like the 12 meter corner radius I've used is a bit larger than perhaps what is needed. And something that could be considered is what is called a truck apron that encourages passenger vehicles to take a tighter turning path while still accommodating that infrequent large truck. And you're starting to see more of those come up in, in designs. It looks something like this, but the materials can be very different, uh, but that's a key element to making these even safer. And uh, that's it. Thanks for tuning in to this video. I hope it's really useful and I hope it inspires you to advocate for this type of infrastructure in your community and to show that it's really not that hard. Thanks for your time and have, and uh, we'll see you next time.